the American Bar Association is focusing on this issue in the United States. And for those of you who aren't aware, it is a new discovery for most of the um, Americans. We didn't realize we know that there's trafficking, and we think about trafficking in terms of guns and drugs. And then if we think about human trafficking, we think about Asia or Latin America. And only in the last two years or so, despite a lot of work by a lot of people on these issues within the United States, would I say the public has even come to read a bit about the problem we have in the United States, which is serious, enormous, horrible, and everywhere. Uh, so I won't give you much of a lecture, except it would help me quite a bit before I introduce the panel and allow them to introduce themselves, uh, to see, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you are here to learn about the extent and the breadth of trafficking? And how many of you are here to learn about some of the solutions to it? So a little bit of 101 wouldn't be too bad. Okay, so I'm going to start first by telling you that you are lucky, all right, because you have a rock star panel. And the rock star panel starts on my right with Jean Batschneider, who has retired, although you'll hear that that's a, uh, just an oxymoron of a word for her, um, retired from the position of Vice President of Global Procurement and Supply Chain for ExxonMobil. And next, sitting with me, all right, Ima Matul, child labor survivor from the United States, uh, working with the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, we know it as CAST, all right? And uh, that is a survivor organizer. And she is originally from Indonesia, but she's with us in Los Angeles permanently now. And there's me, and all the way over on my left, Rashna Manbansur, and um, Rashna is a very, she's going, to, she's going to tell you in a moment what she's going to contribute because she comes from a different perspective, which is really important to what we're talking about. Um, but she's cluster leader, internal communications, public communication, and economic and financial policy and research team, Ministry of Finance and Economic Development, Mauritius. And then, next to her, Tara. Tara Dermott, Head of Development, MTV Exit Program, the foundation based out of Thailand, Tara is based in Thailand, and never, rarely last, and never least, <laughs> Marilyn Carlson Nelson, Chairman, Carlson, that would be the Carlson Hotels, and Carlson Wagon Lee. But uh, what I've asked them to do to start with is to give you their 30 second, what we know as elevator speech, about why they're here, what perspective, what are they doing that brings them to this panel? What is the perspective they're going to bring to the conversation? May I start on my left with Rashna? Yeah. Well, I'm at the Ministry of Finance, so obviously the main thing when everybody hears that I'm from finance is the money. <laughs> so basically it's the finance mobilization of the financial resources to combat human trafficking. And I will also speak about some policies that has been taken at the level of government in my country to combat uh, human trafficking. Uh, I'll speak about the policies later. Great. Just an introduction uh, from your perspective, Tara. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a little bit longer just to explain MTV Exit. MTV Exit aims to prevent human trafficking through raising awareness and inspiring behavior change and social action. And we do this globally. But the MTV Exit Foundation itself is a unique public-private partnership. We are governed by MTV, so Music Television International, but we are 100% funded as a non-profit. We are an independent foundation registered in the UK. So our primary funders are the US Agency for International Development, the Australian Agency for International Development, UNICEF, other such donors. Um, our primary target audience are people aged 15 to 30 globally, but depending on what activity is, and recently we did the largest, the first ever international concert in Myanmar, there were 70,000 people in the audience, so there were certainly people younger than 15 and older than 30. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that my CEO couldn't come today. She is from the Corporate Social Responsibility of Viacom International, and I think she would have lent some really great insights to the role of business, but that is definitely <coughs> represented well here. So the perspective that I can give as the head of development is that I actually oversee our relationships with our government partners across the world, as well as the anti-trafficking community. I oversee research and learning, which is 
vital for doing effective activities of any kind. Um, and most importantly to me, I oversee our direct youth engagement activities. So that's why I'm here. Marilyn. Okay. Um, I've had a lot of titles in my life, but I think today I'd have to use the title abolitionist, um, like the rest of the people on this panel, and I think many of you in this room. As chairman of CEN, and just uh, retired CEO after 10 years as CEO of Carlson, I should explain that Carlson is in travel, hotels, and restaurants around the world in over 100 countries, 180,000 people um, under our brands around the world. And it's been my great privilege to lead that company and to also lead our efforts um, in children at risk. Our company is actually a family-owned business, so we think multi-generationally. It's very consistent with our strategy that we concern ourselves with, with families, with rights. Uh, we are in the service business, so people are our business, and it became immediately apparent to us as we travel around the world that there is an unequal uh, representation of human rights wherever we traveled, and that we should have our own, establish our own policies and standards and procedures. We were called upon by the U.S. State Department and the United Nations who recognized that as leaders in travel and hospitality, we had a unique platform to address human trafficking because much of the, many of the transactions take place in hotels, motels uh, across the world. And that in our travel business, that we work with immigration authorities, custom authorities, border control, and that that also gave us a unique network to try to address the problem. So we, um, I'll tell you a little later what kinds of activities we've undertaken in our abolitionist role in addition to all the other services that we are privileged uh, to provide around the world. In that, what perspective are you bringing? Well, um, from perspective from survivors, um, well, that me explain first of all, cast us. Um, we are based in Los Angeles, California, and we provide services to a victim of human trafficking. We provide uh, shelter, uh, case management, legal services, and um, um, training and outreach to the community. And um, so I'm here to speak uh, on behalf of survivors and what survivors can collaborate on. And Jean? Hello. Hi back there. <laughs> uh, whenever I come to a room like this and I see so many faces I haven't met before, I go, yes, these are new recruits to be into the fight against human trafficking. So welcome. I now count you as a friend and as a fellow abolitionist. I was at a retreat with uh, students from seven countries and they all call themselves abolitionists. And they left the meeting going out to, to, to really save the world. So I, I love the zeal. Um, I spent 35 years in the private sector. Most of that with ExxonMobil Corporation, a little tiny organization most people have heard of. Um, the last 20 years, I have run their supply chain and procurement operation, which is globally around. So it's a hundred billion dollar buy. Remember that because we're going to talk about the power of businesses, the fact that we buy all over the world. Um, uh, seven years ago, while I was in my job, I um, ran into a case of human trafficking coming out of Luanda, Angola, one night. And um, I can tell you that story later or, or after the session. But after that night and the days that followed, I became committed to this space. And I always knew that in the third era of my life, which is 60 to 95, because at 95 my, grandma, my grandmother and grandfather said that's the point at which you actually take a breath and have to slow down. So for the next 35, 40 years, I hope to be working in this space and on two fronts. One is how to raise awareness and how to combat it um, uh, in a number of ways. And from the business perspective, how do you clean up supply chains? Because I actually think the fight needs to be a 360 degree fight. It has to include businesses, governments, civil society, youth movements, all of us up here on the stage and all of you out there. So that's the perspective I bring to this fight. With a lot of energy, I, right, which, we, which we all have. 
um, and we keep re-energizing ourselves. I asked initially um, from the audience, before some of you have walked in, uh, what you wanted to hear, what you needed to hear, and why you came. So uh, I've been asked to give, just set the table on trafficking so that we're all, um, at least uh, as we go forward in this conversation, talking from the same place. So we are using the word human trafficking, uh, but the word abolitionist is what I prefer because we are talking about slavery. We are not talking about the movement of people. We are not talking about the movement of guns or drugs. We are talking about enslaved and people for sale. When I speak about this in the U.S., I speak quite clearly about the fact that we are today celebrating the 150th anniversary of our Emancipation Proclamation. And yet in what we like to call the land of the free, we have unfree in our country of a minimum of 100,000 U.S. citizens in slavery today as we speak. Now add to that figure the, the tens of thousands of human beings who are brought across the border into the United States. And those are, are uncountable. Every one of the people I'm talking about is silent and underground. This is a criminal activity. It is the fastest growing criminal activity in the world other than drugs, much faster than guns, all right? Because as has been said many times, but I don't feel can be said enough, when you buy a gun, all right, you're buying it once. When you're selling it, you're selling it once. When you're selling a hit of drugs, you're selling it once. When you <coughs> capture a human being, you, you are using him or her over and over and over again, either forced labor or rape, sometimes 20 times a day, until they die. Because they are slaves, actually incarcerated, locked behind doors, forced addicted so that they stay with you, or by threats of violence to them, which have been carried out, or to their families who can be identified. Your sister lives down the block, you're mine, and I'll describe that later. Or you are coerced by fraud. You are told that you're coming desperate for food, coming into the US or any other country in the world because you are going to be a model, because you're going to dance, because you're going to be a nanny, because you're going to do domestic work, and you find yourself enslaved, unable to escape, unable to escape, and then treated in a manner that is so horrible, so horrible, that a human being cannot actually understand that another human being could do this, except that we have seen so many examples of horror in war. I am talking about something to that extent and frankly, um, as I also am not reticent to describe this, if your baby is picked up off the street, if your little girl is picked up off the street, you would almost want her to be dead rather than to be treated as she is treated as a slave in this world. We are talking about forced labor and we are talking about forced sex. And that is what we're discussing right now. That's what drives us and many of you in the room and today, we're talking about collaborative solutions. We're going to get down to practical. We're going to be interactive. There's not going to be seven minutes of a speech from each person here. We're going to answer questions, and then we're going to ask you to formulate very simple questions. So as you're thinking about your questions, know that I'm known to be quite rude. All right, there'll be no statements first. The question first. And if you want to share because you have a solution, then give us the solution in your 30-second elevator speech. And that means that anybody who's interested in that program can speak to you afterwards. Um, so prepare to be treated rudely. Right. <laughs> but lovingly. But lovingly. <laughs> Passionately, right? But definitely, right? So let's, let's start with where you were, Jane on the business community and how they come into the picture. And there's a number of people here who can share. But why don't you give us a sense of what hats you wear and, uh, and where we are. I can speak a little bit about the ABA next too, but I would, uh, ABA being American Bar Association, initials being a terrible thing to get in the habit of. So Jean, tell us what role can the business community play collaboratively all right, in order to eliminate slavery in this world? Well, first of all, I, I think the context that needs to be set is I do believe we're at an inflection point 
And for the economists in the world uh, and the audience, that means a point where we could really do a step change, a major ramp up in terms of awareness and combating because I think we have had NGOs and governments and, and a number of uh, members of civil society working in the space for 10 to 12 years. But in order to get that step change, we need businesses to come in. And the reason we need businesses to come in, I, I, I want to deal with it on the demand side and on the supply side. You think about businesses, they buy services, they buy raw materials, they buy goods. They buy trillions of dollars. And in that buy, there's a responsibility that goes with that to make sure there's not forced labor in that buy. So the first and very simple thing that businesses need to do is clean up their supply chain. So uh, th there are a number of things that very specifically had to be, have to be done. And if, if you all were corporate executives, I'd be talking to you about how you qualify your suppliers, what kind of fitting processes you use, uh, what kind of contractual language you have to make sure that uh, uh, your suppliers are living up to their obligations. I'd be talking about audits of your vendors and your suppliers. I'd be talking about how deep your supply chain is. Because for a large corporation like ExxonMobil, that supply chain can go 12, 13 deep. You buy a flange, you contract with a big EPC contractor who contracts with somebody in Germany, who then contracts with somebody in, in China, who then gets their raw materials from someplace else. And every time you add a layer, you've got to verify the quality of that material and services and how it was produced. And I think that's where corporations have to begin to, to get involved. We have been creating an anti-human trafficking uh, an assessment toolkit because there hasn't been a tool that guides companies to understand what their supply chain looks like. I won't go into a lot of details, but in that toolkit, the first thing you get is a heat map that says, tell me what your spend is and where it is, and we're going to array it according to data that we know, which is not great, but it, at least it's a start, and tell you where you're at risk. So we took the ExxonMobil spend, arrayed it, and Gravel and Angola came up. So I said, Gravel and Angola, what's that all about? Well, well, you know what it's about? Child labor. Most gravel in many developing countries is produced by children. So that's the, the demand side. And I can go on way too long on this side, and I'll stop there, except for I want to then go to the supply side. If you're a corporation and you're, wherever you are, you have to be a good corporate citizen. And there's a business rationale for that. Because if you invest in the community, what do you get? You get strong, productive, committed workers. So if I open up shop in Chad, what can I do there to help my business? Train, educate, finance small business, finance local content so that I'm buying from, uh, from uh, local vendors. And what does that do for trafficking? It means I don't have to traffic myself. I don't have to sell my children into trafficking because I have a living wage in my own country. I'm staying put. I'm not going to sell myself into the trafficking field. So that supply side becomes extremely important for businesses to participate in. And then finally, money. We're talking, I mean, I came in the private sector. I'm now working it with a number of NGOs. The power of money is huge. We have to have funding to be able to do things like a global hotline that we're working on and other things. Um, service providers, uh, um, law enforcement. So I'll stop there, but I think it has to be both demand and supply. Each element that we're going to talk about has a component about what you can do, what somebody else could do, how you can be involved. One of the components here is that the American Bar Association, the lawyer, the business lawyers have come together to take ExxonMobil's lead, to take Carlson's lead, <coughs> to take the, the, uh, the group that Maryland, of which Maryland was a founder, which is <coughs> the Global Business Coalition Against Trafficking, Business Coalition Against Trafficking and take the protocols that they have developed and put them into a model business <coughs> supply chain code, a voluntary code, layered on top of whatever, what is currently required in the United States. Because remember, I'm looking at US corporations with a global reach. So at, in the US, we have, we have corporations that are mandated on Federal Corrupt Practices Act, are mandated on child labor, are mandated on money laundering. They're already auditing way deep to, in the supply chain. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they took these business conduct standards that are directed toward anti-slavery and trafficking, eliminating slaves from producing goods and services, and just put them on top of the audit order 
which they're already accomplishing. Now, of course, that's way too simple, but yet it isn't. It's a voluntary request, and that's the kind of thing. Do you know somebody in large or mid-sized corporation who's, who's human resources or who is compliance and governance? If you do, that's the pe those are the people we want to take a look at these business conduct standards so that every mid-sized, small cap, and then we have to talk about the ability to scale, which we'll talk about later. Now, this is your baby, right? So talk to us about I what does corporations come? I talk to you about come? a very practical experience. We actually came into this in 2000. We signed ECPAT, which is End Child Prostitution and Trafficking, in 2004. And I can tell you from just a personal experience in this thing, through the first large multinational company to sign ECPAT. There had been others in Asia, but n no one with the global reach that we had. And you ask why? Well, in one case, because many of our colleagues in our industry, though the industry would make statements anti-trafficking, that when it came to individual corporations, often the legal department said, we don't want to sign something. They said, we don't know how we're going to affect compliance with this. They would just thought this is a dark subject, no one wants to talk about it, we don't want it connected with our brand in any way. So it was not easy. The other thing is that the PR people in the corporation say, oh my goodness, you know, Marilyn, you're in the happiness business. We connect travelers, we take business travelers all over the world to, to do business. How can we even talk about this dark subject and in any way have an implication that we have in any way been a part of this? We made the decision because of the moral imperative and what turned out is definitely to Jean's point, it was our employees who took so much pride in the fact that we were living our own credo, that our, our entire credo based on leadership, based on respect and caring and service, that it's totally consistent that we care about people who are being children who are being trafficked. So what, what did we do yeah. first? You need, whatever your role, if you can talk to your corporations, first about simply establishing a policy, an ethical policy regarding the commercial exploitation of children, explicit among all the policies that you have in your policy statement and your policy training. And secondly, train your personnel. Our hotel training, we have living and leading responsible business. All of us have training for our, for our policies around the environment, around various kinds of sustainability, about how we interact, about our transparency. We needed to add this entire question of trafficking into our policy training. All of our people around the world, but we do have training materials. It was not our objective to have our commitment to ending trafficking as a differentiator. We wanted to share our materials. We've translated our materials into several languages. We have offered them to other hotel companies. At this point, um, I think Hilton has finally come around and is using materials and is doing training. Wyndham is doing the same. I encourage you not only to bring your corporations into the fold, ask them to, to talk to their industries because this is something that can be industry-wide. Again, it's not a competitive advantage. It, it, it turns out in a way to be, because there are people who say, we want to do business who, who's, who take this stand. We want to do business with companies that take what this stand. What about employee awareness? But then you also have, in terms of employee awareness, on our website, we, we, talk, about, um, we talk about what to look for, we talk about how to report it, we talk about the number to uh, the numbers that you can use, both the Polaris number. We have worked with the State Department uh, so that in some countries we need to encourage our people, given them numbers, to call at the embassy. Then we have um, increased awareness among travelers so that in on Carlson Bag and Lee, if you were to go to some of the countries that the American TIP report um, identifies in the third tier as the highest risk companies, that then we have an advisory. Um, I'll give you the language. Um, that UNICEF reports that trafficking in children for purposes of sexual exploitation is a global problem. The U.S. State Department advises its citizens that engaging in sexual conduct with minors outside the U.S. 
is a crime and punishable upon return to the United States. Travelers can help by reporting suspicious activity to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, that's Polaris, 1-888-373-7888. When calling from outside the U.S., we give them a number. Carlson Magdalene Travels supports the protection of the world's children. We have to ask the permission of, the corporate, of each of our corporate clients to put this on their itineraries. We've only had one, we do business with the majority of the Fortune 500. We've only had one company that didn't want us to use this language. So we're going to talk about national awareness in a minute because it's tremendously important. Rashna's been wanting to participate on this issue, yeah. so we'll turn to her for a second. Yeah. The fact that we're speaking corporate social responsibility, CSR, I think companies there yeah, should make earmark funding for CSR, all companies maybe voluntarily or mandatory. In my country, it is mandatory. The corporate tax is 15%, but according to the Income Tax Act, 2% of all uh, profit should go to CSR funding. So these companies, either they spend it themselves, or if they don't spend it, they have to reimburse the income tax office. So this, uh, in a way, encourages companies to participate in CSR programs. I think these policies should be, I mean, either voluntary or mandatory. It's important to enforce this participation in uh, the community and social response. So, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting point, but you're asking the government to change its taxing and its uh, charitable exemption. So how do you mainstream this concept of trafficking into the government thought process and policies. Yeah, it, it, it comes from the top. From us, for us, our minister, was, uh, the minister at the time, was very concerned about poverty alleviation. So uh, that's why uh, he wanted to look for resources to combat poverty and uh, uh, promote a, 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 a society where there is uh, this integration the poor are integrated. So at that time, the funding, it had either the choice of uh, increasing uh, taxes or uh, cutting down expenditure. He didn't want to increase income tax. So what he did, he, it was a, a way to masquerade the income tax. So he did a 2% CSR mandatory uh, was enforced. Yeah. I just should add to that. It's very interesting what's happening around the world. There's philanthropy, and of course, in the United States, you have your deduction, your charitable deduction, which to uh, an extent is what you're speaking of, which is to use that money for, for to support NGOs. Yeah. And we as well do that, and we are funding some rehabilitation and reintegration and, uh, in this area with that kind of charitable funds. What I'm talking about encouraging companies is to just actually integrate it into the strategic, uh, into the, the strategic focus of the organization, and recognize that that above the line investment in doing the right thing, creating environments of respect, and creating environments where people are compliant with the laws and the standards that you set, is integrated right into the fabric and the value set of, of the mission-driven corporation. Good point. Can I build on Rashna, though, too? Because I, I think, I maybe because I've become a bit jaded on the CSR spending, um, that, that CSR, Corporate Social, Social Responsibility, responsibility. <laughs> and, and that um, I have become so action-oriented, rather than having um, broadcast information or sending out documents or any of that, that, that what we have is on the demand side, you take out non-compliant suppliers. So if you look at the Amakali workers on the tomato fields in Florida, uh, they got McDonald's and Safeway to take out non-compliant suppliers who are using um, uh, labor, forced labor. Um, and on the supply side, okay, the spending should be on training and development, not on CSR communication as much. So while I think it's important, I want us to go to the next level of taking that funding to action. Tara, right. you were All right. Yeah, I actually just wanted to speak from the nonprofit perspective, and I, I'm guessing there are a number of people that work for nonprofits here, and we do everything on a shoestring budget, so I think that a significant role of business, it's virtually impossible to get cash 
from corporations. They're just, they're, they hold it tightly, they generally have it planned, what they're going to be doing with their CSR funding years in advance, they've got a specific um, issue that is important to them. But what we've done is we've been really strategic about hitting up businesses um, for in-kind support that we need. And, and we do this across the board. Give for, us some specific I, examples. I'm, Good. Yeah, we do this across the board for a variety of things, but a couple of specific examples. One is airlines. Um, we've been able to get airlines to sponsor free flights for performers that we're bringing to events, for youth leaders that we're bringing, not just across countries, but across regions <coughs> to come together to learn from one another and build networks. They pick up our programming and show it on their in-flight entertainment. This is the kind of thing that they're not giving us cash, but this is worth millions for us, right, over time. Um, and it just took, and it's not easy, but it does take persistence and it does take, you know, speaking their language and showing them how this benefits them. Um, another example is, uh, despite the fact that we are with MTV, we don't broadcast only on MTV channels. In most of the countries that we work in, there is no MTV or the reach of MTV is very small. So we partner with free-to-air broadcasters and we don't spend the <coughs> broadcast time ever. Um, and so this is even harder depending on where you are, but frankly in a lot of the most at-risk countries, they're desperate for quality television programming. So don't waste your money on short-form PSAs. Make a TV show and they will broadcast it, um, especially if there's some element, so it's you know, using edutainment, we call it, ed right? Entertaining, uh, but educational. Uh, they will pick it up and they will broadcast it. So those are, um, those are just two examples of ways that, uh, yeah, it's, positive to work with businesses. So I want you all to be thinking about awareness, because that's going to be our next topic. But on training, I want to talk to Emma about the leadership training that she's doing, your leadership program. I feel like I can't talk all of this woman right here. <laughs> you can talk I wish that my uh, CEO is here and present to all of you. Um, because my focus is on not supply chains, no, on you know all that. <laughs> Stuff. Um, I'm focused on leadership program, which is a program for the survivors. Um, me myself is a survivor of human trafficking in domestic services. It's so funny when you said that USA just um, started two years ago with this work, and actually I was brought to the US in 1997. That's right. <laughs> so it was way more than two years ago. Um, so. The survival leadership program that um, organized, uh, it was uh, informed in 2003. Um, CAS um, provide a long-term services for victims, and once they graduate from the program for the services that they need, uh, we have extended program that we call the survival leadership program. The, the, in, in the beginning, the vision was to just uh, create community of survivors because most of the survivors that we have in our program are from all over the world, from other countries, and they don't have a family in the U.S. So we create our own community. We, we, um, you know, we, we support each other because you know we don't have family. We create our own family. We support each other, but. These survivors want to do more than just to support each other. They want to implement the law. They want to make the law of human trafficking better. Um, so the survivor program, uh, the survivor um, group is um, we um, we doing um, advocacy. We receive a training on media, how to do a public policy, how to how to be a better advocate. So in in year 2008, we, la um, we had this um, um, a campaign. Um, we call it the Green Card Campaign because most of the uh, people in the group are foreigner. And um, in uh, TVP TVPRA, the Trafficking <coughs> Victim Protection Act, uh, year 2000, there is a lot that we um, as a foreigner, we can become a permanent resident to stay in the country, but it doesn't say how. You know, so like um, we were provided with the T visa, but there's uh, they said that we after three years of the T visa we can have um, T being trafficking visa, right? 
and um, we can uh, uh, become a permanent resident of the U.S. But that law wasn't in place yet, and our T visa was expired. So for two years we were on the limbo. Our T visa expired, and we don't have our permanent residence. So as a survivor, a group of survivor, we um, we collect a signature. We we went to Sacramento, we went to Washington, D.C. to advocate for that um, a green card campaign. So in year 2009, actually end of 2008, the law was passed. And early 2009, most of the survivors received um, their green card. There's an, one example. And, um, and also <coughs> in California, there was in national level and in local level, in year 2010, um, the group, our group, um, advocate for a supply chain in California, which is, you know, passed in 2010. Okay, but we're not going to go there yet. We're so, on your survivor okay, leadership let program. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let me comment on um, a couple of things we've just spoken about. As a corporation, once we started, um, we discovered that it was like there was an elephant on the end of the string because you can't ask your people to make a call if they see something going on or they suspect something going on if no one picks up the phone. So we became involved with, with Polaris and the importance of having a phone that's answered quickly, that a victim can call, that an ambassador or someone who sees something can call and something happens. So then we became involved community in our community and now trying to create best practices with the training of law enforcement. Because if you make a call, the law enforcement needs to understand the issue and needs to have options of what to do both with the perpetrator. So the courts have to be willing to prosecute. With the victim, they need a place to take the victims. So that's where I think the nonprofits become extremely important because there are very few bids across the world that are really ready for victims to be rehabilitated, help to move them off of drugs, etc. And this is so interrelated that it's a community-wide issue because you have to train the law enforcement, you have to help and protect the victims so they're willing to actually testify. Because if the victims aren't protected, given psychological support, as we heard uh, from our friend from um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, we have to give them the psychological support to testify. In the whole world, there have been 7,000 prosecutions that, um, according last year, um, of, of that, some nearly five were actually convictions. And you know, thousands of young children and people were saved. But the fact is that that can happen if you don't actually have some way to protect victims so that they're willing to, to actually testify and your courts are willing to prosecute. So what you, <coughs> what you discover is that community by community, you need to pull together a network of people, the law enforcement, the policy makers, the corporations, the hospitals, and Collectively raise your awareness. We need these folks like, <laughs> like Laurel to give her speech so that get or show a film, get the emotional and intellectual commitment to dealing with the issue, and then let each group go back and use its platform, but you have to work cross sector. So that's what perfect. we're learning. Right, because the, our topic is collaboration. Exactly. And we're going to spend some, and we are already starting to talk about each project that we have in terms of the collaboration necessary. If, I'm going to switch, which is not really a switch, because I think you're going to find that everything we're saying is so intertwined that this is such a complex problem and has so many faces. So let's talk for a second about awareness of the problem and the problems all right, that we face in that awareness uh, search for a manner in which we can make people aware. So first, the, the questions are, to whom are we speaking? Are we speaking to people who are simply citizens of a country to make them aware that they have slavery in their country? Are we speaking to the NGOs who have the ability to fight and build or give resources to help the victims? Are we speaking to the NGOs 
who are training the, for what we would call first responders, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the judges, the law enforcement, the hospital personnel who see these victims when they've been beaten and have only two or three minutes in which to identify the problem before the person who is their captor shows up to protect their, uh, their livelihood. Who, how do we get messages to victims who will never self-identify? That's the thing that's so different here. Never self-identify because they're afraid or they don't have papers and they think they're going to be deported or they're again protecting their family or they think they're, they owe a debt that keeps growing and they don't understand that they, that's not bondage. They see it as bondage. All right? but what we, because when we look at it, we say, well, why didn't they just walk away? Because they couldn't. They didn't have their papers and they thought they owed the money and that this person would chase them and their family forever. So there are the ties that keep this horror silent. And we have to figure out the kind of commu communication techniques that will answer that. So let's talk about national awareness from collaborative government, anything that you want to bring. Um, Rachna? Yeah, I, I think awareness should be targeted, focus. You can't uh, say we do general, target everybody and say <coughs> you'll spend money and it won't uh, achieve its purpose. I'll give you an example. Uh, I once was scolding my daughter. I'm scolding her and she suddenly she said, Mom, stop scolding. I will call 155. I was surprised. I, wasn't, I didn't know what 155 was. <laughs> then I asked her, what is 155? She told me, you don't know. It's the number you call when parents are abusing their child. <laughs> so I told her, but how come you know it and I don't know it? She says, okay, we were uh, during school vacation. We were watching comic strips. And during the comic strip, the ads was uh, about this, whether you're beating a child or you, whether you know someone who beats a child, whether you are a victim, call 155. So you'd be surprised for two or three months whenever I scolded her, make your bed or whatever, she, she started blackmailing me. Don't speak to me like that. I'll call 155. <laughs> now it was my turn to explain to her what happens when you call 155. <coughs> That's what I'm telling you. Target it. We do sensitization in secondary school where people are sensitized, but, uh, youth are sensitized because they are vulnerable. They are the vulnerable groups. So how to identify who are the vulnerable groups? The those living in poverty pockets whether those are at school, those are in abroad, and then I think this is where the campaigns, the sensitization should be targeted <coughs> to achieve the purpose. So that's a perfect segue to Tara and behavioral change, so talk to us. Well, so I'm gonna build off that, just give an example of targeted interventions. Um, so MTV Exit, we do a range of, we make television programs, do concerts, youth workshops, um, but if we're talking about the target audience being young people who are at risk of being trafficked in Southeast Asia, and let's just pick Cambodia, for example, um, it's, I think that Laurel's introduction of what trafficking is was key, and, and slavery is the end point, the exploitation at the end of the process. But if you're think, looking at the UN Palermo Protocol, which defines trafficking, that process is key for effective interventions for prevention. So what we do is we understand what that process is, how people are ending up in that situation of exploitation, the situation of slavery, um, and we make programs that are specifically, they highlight the exploitation to show that it's trafficking, but they're really focused primarily on the journey that those individuals took. Because the truth is, is that in Southeast Asia, most people are leaving home voluntarily. The point of deception, the point where they're tricked into a situation of exploitation is coming later. So what we want to do is understand the process by which we got there, they got there, and then make a program that highlights that so that anyone in the communities that were then distributing that program, whether it's through NGO partners who are doing educational outreach to key stakeholders, or in schools, or on television, or on radio versions, um, we want them to hear that, oh, you know, and learn that if they leave home with the equivalent of $30 on their, on their being, they are 80% less likely less likely to be exploited in Thailand than if they left home with less than that and took favors on the way. Um, you know, so we want to be able to communicate that kind of targeted message um, and promote safe migration in that way so that we are 
hopefully effectively reducing, and I say hopefully because the other incredibly important thing about targeted messages in any awareness campaigns or prevention is measurement, right? Don't make a program without pre-testing it with your target audience, making sure that they're understanding, and I love the nodding, um, you know, that they're understanding what you want them to understand from the program, and then also go back in and to the best of your ability, find out if it worked, right? Did people, were their levels of knowledge increased, were their attitudes toward the issue increased, and do they have better intended practice if you can't do a longer term, did they do the right thing in practice assessment? Uh, I have mixed feelings about the general awareness question because if we really want corporations to consider this um, a policy that they would initiate and train against, and if we want corporations to make, raise this on the priority list of, um, of their not-for-profit contributions and so on, I think that CEOs and thought leaders and corporations are watching CNN, and that having CNN address this problem is one of the ways that we've made some of the progress that we have made. We have made the progress in the last couple of years, and I think that some of the general media, you need kind of umbrella, uh, uh, umbrella awareness, and then you need the specific targeted awareness. But it's a lot easier to raise funds if you have a, a, a much broader issue, a, a broader <coughs> swath of the population aware of the problem. And certainly in our country, fact that in every state in the United States, this is a problem. And in, in my state, we were one of the top 10 states. We have a lot of uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Scandinavians who go for a premium, it seems, on some of these markets. And so for when we appeal to uh, parents about the fact that we can't protect our own children if we don't protect these children because it could happen on any street, it could happen in any shopping area, it could happen with any child, no matter how healthy the family, where some argument ensues and there's a runaway child or someone who leaves home because they feel that, 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 that they can do better somewhere else and that they become immediately vulnerable. So the point, again, you're making it well, is that it's not so much could, it does. All right, the, the child who's abused at home runs away and finds the trafficker, the captor, all right, at the bus station, finds the captor, and they look like us. They don't look seedy, all right? They look like very well put together, either very good looking guys, you know, who are a little older but young and, and hot. Okay, so these girls say, oh, you know, I'll go, home, I'll go home with him and he'll help me out and, you know, it's not such a bad experience but they're running away from a horror in their own home, so they have no place else to go. Right. But uh, you go into a restaurant anywhere in this world, and you walk to the back, and you see that there are beds in the back, and that the cook is sleeping there, or the cleaning help is sleeping there, or you order your own, uh, come to my house, two or three people for an hour of cleaning, and they come from the Ukraine, or Bulgaria, or uh, Romania, because they're coming from organized crime, but the bottom line of national awareness is that we, what we're hearing right now is that every, almost every campaign requires a number to call. So I wanted to talk yeah. to Jean. Yeah, I'm dying to get into this discussion. Okay. I, uh, I, I, really from a potential victims or the at-risk population, just to finish that last little debate, uh, uh, the statistics indicate that a runway is approached by a trafficker within 48 hours of running away. Um, and and uh, that's a U.S. statistic, and I'm going to take this broader in a minute. But I, I mentioned that in this era of my life, I'm, I'm chairing the National Leadership Council for the Project, and we put together a Vision 2020, which is to try to have a certain number of things in place by the year 2020. Um, and one of those is a global hotline. Right now, we run the only um, uh, independent, the government sponsors us, gives us part of our funding, but only a part of it hotline in the U.S. It's been in place since 2008. It has gone from 300 calls a month to 3,000 calls. We've just implemented uh, texting, be free, and we had our first bust on be free last week. It went into place a week and a half ago and we had our first bust last week. We just recently received a Google Ideas grant of $3 million to begin to take that concept 
of a hotline and extend it globally. So by 2020, it's a $25 million project. We're hoping to have hotlines in place in most of the world, or a network of hotlines. We have, in the Google grant, we kicked off Liberty Asia, which is an effort to put hotlines in seven countries in Asia, um, including Cambodia, um, and to put the hotline, to build on the beginning of hotlines in Europe um, <coughs> through La Strada, and take those learnings uh, and, and develop a network around the world so we ultimately have a global coordination center where we coordinate a network of hotlines. Now, if you have a hotline and you call the hotline, somebody better answer, right? Or you're not going to call again. So what's really critical to build these hotlines is a root system of good guy law enforcement. In other words, law enforcement that aren't going to sell you again, which is a problem in some parts of the world. And service providers who can take, uh, take people in, uh, and, uh, give them skills, and show that they don't go back onto the street. So this global hotline, I think, is, is really key. Now in the U.S., we have built awareness by getting that hotline on train stations, in bathrooms, um, uh, on highways, um, in communities. This, this one young um, girl who was 14 who uh, saw Be Free on a, on a, uh, it was a little thing at a women's health clinic. She ripped it off. She was trafficking from California to the Carolinas and texted us when her pimp went to the next room. She had already had five men in her room and said, uh, text us. We started a texting discussion with her and we were able to scramble authorities and we got her out and the pimp was arrested. Um, but that's the kind of thing we have to be able to do. It's not just sex trafficking though. The biggest numbers are in labor trafficking. I mean, sex trafficking is a horrific thing. Children, uh, uh, adults who are forced into it, uh, but, but labor trafficking is a huge world problem, um, and, and, and the global hotline is going to be designed for, for that as well. So who's picking the fruit? Who's picking the cotton? Who's working on the silk farms? I, who is manufacturing the widgets? Yeah, right. I just need to make one other comment, since I have this group here, is that <laughs> another part of this funding is to map all the existing hotlines so if you know of a hotline in your country, uh, even if it's a citywide hotline, we want to know about it because we're building a network uh, 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 of service providers. So um, I just spoke at the General Assembly of the United Nations and I had tons of people come up. We're following up on all of those. So if you know of hotlines out there, uh, we're mapping those right now and it's a key component of building the global hotline. And so before I move off awareness because the victims are so hard to identify, I does anybody here want to speak to that uh, briefly? Actually, I, I just want to build off the hotline thing. And, and that, um, I think a quick solution is don't ever put anything out about trafficking without having some hotline or helpline. Um, and we, we found that we get, we get a lot of, well, how do you know if you put it on, on TV and it's just there for a minute? How do you know anyone's going to use it? I can tell you that after the concert that we did, we film all of our events and then broadcast it on TV and put it on VCDs. And, um, the, the Burmese language hotline in Thailand that we were promoting as like, if you happen to need help once you get there, um, received on average between 150 and 300 calls in the three hours after each and every broadcast. And most of those calls were just people saying, hey, I just want to make sure this number works. <sighs> Putting it on my phone and taking it with me, right? And that's exactly what we want people to do. Um, and the other anecdote I want to give, if I can tell a little story, but it's really exciting. Um, so we made a program, we, we made a documentary program, we've made a series of them for 12 countries in Southeast Asia, and what they do is they feature um, the top three trends for each of the countries that we're focused on. And so we happened to make one for Thailand, which was featuring the story of a Thai woman who was trafficked to Japan for sexual exploitation, a Cambodian man trafficked to Thailand for um, exploitation in the fishing industry, which by the way, hugely exploitative, look into it. Um, and then also a, a, Lao, a Laotian woman who was trafficked into Thailand and trapped for 10 years in someone's home as a domestic worker without ever receiving a dime for her efforts or being able to leave the compound. Um, but So we create this program, we broadcast it on terrestrial broadcaster, Free to Air Thailand, and it also gets picked up by cable providers, which to us, it's great, pick it up, put it everywhere. Just so happens it broadcasts in Indonesia, where a Cambodian man trapped on a Thai fishing boat has docked and is given a little bit of tea money to go to a tea house 
He goes in there. He's watching this program, and he sees the story of the Nock, who has been trapped, uh, who is telling the story of being trapped on a fishing boat and having to escape by swimming. This guy's watching it and realizing, this is me. It hadn't occurred to him that he had put all this time into being on this boat and that he would actually never be paid. There would never be anything for his efforts, and he just needed to get out now. So he sits there, memorizes the phone number at the end of the program, goes back to the boat, talks to the other Cambodian men on the boat. They pull their tea money so they can make one call. And this happens to be an international call because it was a program for Thailand. But they make that call. That agency then calls an agency in Indonesia, which calls Indonesian law enforcement. They're able to get to the dock. The guy could give them a boat number. They rescue those four guys from that boat and six guys from another boat. All of them were repatriated to Cambodia in January of last year. So first of all, what's the global hotline? All right. At least for now, it's not global. But you can dial it in the United States at 888-3737-888. You know, one of the things we're trying to do right now, and I need to give a shout out to AT&T, mm -hmm. is we're trying, and 155 was an example of, of, uh, of what we're trying to do, because in Europe there is one number for missing and exploited children, is that we're building a platform to have one number globally. The problem is, back to what I said, is if you don't have the root system to support it, what do you do if people call in? But they're also going to give us free uh, calls. Okay. So, and the, we, yep. So, but that's an important piece of this, is if we can get that available and globally, and it's technologically possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So there are some very, very specific, doable solutions. They are scalable. They are as large as a huge global hotline program. They are survivor interface and building leadership and capacity and giving these women, mostly women, the ability to go forward in life and become proud of what they're doing and live a different life. So. And then we have the corporate, the corporate business conduct standards eliminating slavery from supply chain. We have the ability to talk to the employees of every corporation in the world and put every employee on the street with a list of what it looks like, what slavery looks like, identifying victims, just like many of us have been trained to identify a briefcase that's left in an airport. Now we want you to be able to identify victims and then call a hotline to get services. But uh, I'm going to move into our question and answer to start with. All of you can think of something that you want to add at the end. We have time. We have time. But I want to make certain that we're going to handle questions. All right, remember, we're giving no statements. We're giving really succinct questions. We're not going to gather the questions. We're going to answer the questions as they come. Yes, sir. Identify yourself for us. My name is Ali Liani from the Center for Democracy and Human Rights. I think you, yeah, hold on one second. Thank you. My name is Ali Liani from the Center for Democracy and Human Rights in Saudi Arabia, Washington, D.C. What constitutes uh, human trafficking? All right, so we can actually tell you because we have agreed on the Palermo Protocol. Does anybody want to speak to that? Yeah. yeah. So essentially, you need um, you need put there. International. There are many definitions. International That's definition, right, um, UN definition, and we're going to give you just a, a pretty good definition of trafficking. That's uh, that should cover it for you. So for something to constitute human trafficking, mm -hmm. according to the protocol, you need um, three elements: the act, the means, and the purpose. The act is the recruitment or the harboring. A couple other things. Um, um, act means, means is force, fraud, or coercion, and then exploitation. And exploitation can be as is in, you know forced labor, debt bondage, forced sex work. It can also be um, withholding of papers, documents, right? Um, exactly. And then there's also other forms of trafficking, like organ trafficking, forced marriage. Um, but so you need all three of those elements for it to constitute trafficking, except if you're under 18. If you're a child, then the means, force, fraud, or coercion is not necessary because it's believed that if you are a child, then um, you don't have the capacity to make that, you don't need to be deceived. You don't have the capacity to make that choice for yourself to be in a situation of exploitation. I will tell you, a lot of people get all tangled up in the definition. And, and then they don't report because it doesn't technically meet. And I think that, that totally sets us down the wrong path. Uh, I, I disagree. I think that it's. I think that the importance of the definition and the importance of understanding the process of trafficking helps to make strategic responses. That said, if you focus, you know, if you're talking about reporting and people just understand that their rights on a fundamental level are being violated, and they make reports, 
and it's up to the service providers and the judiciary to decide what crime it was. The victim just needs to know they were, they've been a victim. Well, so let me speak to that. That's right. So we have, again, a complex situation, which is relatively simple as we explain it. If you're speaking about the victim, we want them to understand what, what, if they have been coerced, if they are being held as a 